Well, good morning. That was such a warm good morning. Let's try that again. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. It's great to be here at Winsville First Baptist Church. It's great to be here with um, the pastor and his wife. A great time of fellowship with them in Atlanta this week. And it's just good to be here to of the connection between CIU and what the Lord is doing here in the big city of Winsboro. Mm -hmm. Now, I'm honored to be able to come and stand behind the sacred desk this morning and share the gospel story one more time. It's always a privilege and a pleasure to share from God's word. Shall we pray together? Heavenly Father, thank you for this day and day in which none of us have ever seen before. We ask you now, God, to speak through us like you've done so many times before as we show you what. Christ name we pray. Amen. Amen. Before I preach this morning, the pastor wanted me to share a little bit about myself. Um, I'm from Dillon, South Kanky Lanky. Y'all don't know what that is? That's Dillon, South Carolina. I'm by the big metropolis of south of the border. And years ago, people used to come from Fort Bragg and from uh, Pope Air Force Base, and they'd come get married there in the big town of Dillon. So we're known as the marriage capital of the South. Yeah. That's where I'm from. Um, my grandfather was the chairman of the deacon board at the large Baptist church in town, um, which when my father was called to ministry, he hoped that my father would become the pastor of that church because my great-grandfather served as chairman of the deacon board for about 35 years. My grandfather served as chairman of the deacon board for about 35 years. Um, and grandfather handed off the grant and to my my great grandfather handed off to my grandfather. So that's seventy years of continual leadership in that church. And so my grandfather was kind of heartbroken when my daddy decided to do something different. He almost cut him out of his wheel for that. <laughs> um, but my father started a church in the big town of Lata, South Carolina. That's L A T T A. That's not Atlanta. Latter. <laughs> if you if you count more than one red light, you're in the wrong city. You're in the wrong city. Winsboro would be a metropolis beside Latter. There's really nothing there. But my father, the Lord sent him there to start a church, and it was a great gospel witness, and, and it still is a great gospel witness in that city. Um, I married a gal from Columbia almost 23 years ago. Her name is Sylvia, and we have two daughters. Adriana, who happens to be a junior at Columbia International University studying in sports uh, management. Um, she'll be graduating next year, Lord willing, and then she'll be continuing at USC to get her master's in physical therapy, and hopefully a doctor as well. And my youngest daughter is at Vanderbilt University studying neuroscience, and she hopes to be a neurosurgeon. Um, they got all their brains from their mom, none from me, so <laughs> don't, don't, don't get it twisted. Um, we, we enjoy life together. We enjoy ministry together. Um, when we were at the conference this week in Atlanta, um, I was planning on leaving first thing Wednesday morning, and my truck broke down mm -hmm. and um, caused me to have to stay in Atlanta two extra days in order to get my truck fixed. At, at first, I was frustrated that I was having to stay in Atlanta. And then my daughter told me there's so many things we can do in Atlanta to calm your frustration down. <laughs> so we ended up seeing everything we wanted to see in Atlanta for the rest of the week. And um, we got back late Thursday night. And well, we're grateful to be alive because my gas line busted on my truck and they were trying to figure out why it didn't explode. But I'm grateful that the Lord's ministry angels took care of us. Amen. 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 So that's a little bit about myself. I don't have anything else to share, and uh, besides, I like to eat, but you can already tell <laughs> in Jesus' name, amen. This morning, I want to look at um, the Gospel of Luke this morning from Luke chapter 1, Luke chapter 19, verses 1 through 10, and I want to ask a question this morning, who's your one? Who's your one? This text is just a wonderful text to preach from, and Luke, it says, then Jesus entered and passed through Jericho. And um, it says, Now behold, there was a man by the name of Zacchaeus, who was a chief tax collector, and he was rich. And he sought to see who Jesus was, but could not because of the crowd, for he was short of stature. 
So he ran ahead and climbed into, up into a sycamore tree to see him, for he was going to pass that way. And when Jesus came to the place, he looked up and saw him and said to him, Zacchaeus, make haste and come down, for today I must stay at your house. So he made haste and came down and received him joyfully. But when they saw it, they all complained, saying, He has gone to be the guest um, with a man who is a sinner. Then Zacchaeus stood and said to the Lord, Look, Lord, I give half of my goods to the poor, and if I have taken anything from anyone by false accusation, I restore fourfold. And Jesus said unto him, Today salvation has come to this house, because also, because he also is a son of Abraham. For the Son of Man has come to see and to save that which was lost. God's word for the people of God. Thanks be unto to God. Amen. Uh, brothers and sisters, this is such an interesting text this morning. Because uh, I believe this text gives us the blueprint for how we should reach the lost this morning. But I think it also should encourage us that the lost is among us and that we should see the lost and seek the lost and also lead the lost to a saving relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. Luke, as a writer, as a doctor, as a physician, I think he went to Vanderbilt as well, decided to um, give us several things that we should feature in this text that we're looking at. He has an ethical concern for the rich, that the rich take care of the poor. He also brings up this whole idea of the social disfavorment of those who are in power. Take care of them. Um, he also brings up this whole idea of the immediacy of following God. Because Zacchaeus made haste when God said, come down. This also brings up the idea of joy. And joy is one of those subtle things that you see all the way through the book of um, Luke. And, and you can't hardly miss it because page after page, it talks about this joy. He also talks about returning goods to the poor. Restitution for the poor, that is. And above all, he talks about salvation in this text. Brothers and sisters. For a level proposition for this text, I say lead people to Christ. Lead people to Christ. Why is Winsboro, why is Winsboro First Baptist Church here? To lead people to Christ. Why do we have Sunday school at Winsboro First Baptist Church? We do have Sunday school, right? We do. Because we want to lead people to Christ. You know why we have Sunday night service? To lead people to, we do have some of the night service, right? To lead people to Christ. You know why we have Wednesday? We do have Wednesday night service. Right? Because we want to lead people to Christ. The reason why we have a preacher in this church, we do have a preacher, right? We do. Because we want to lead people to Christ. We have any deacons in the church? Why? Because we want to lead people to Christ. From the ushers at the door, from the greeters at the door, to the members who sit on the pew, it's everybody's job in the church to lead somebody to the same knowledge of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen, church. Amen. It, it, it's everybody's responsibility in the church, from the young to the old. Oh, not old. I'm sorry. From the young to the seasoned. <laughs> Your job is to lead someone to Christ. From those who sing in the choir, didn't the choir sound good this morning? Their job is to lead someone to Christ. I think verse 10 is, 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 is captured my world. The Son of Man came to seek and to save those who are lost. Brothers and sisters, that's our job this morning. I want my life, my resources, I want my time spent here to lead someone to Christ. A -a Amen. I want your resources. I want your life, your mission, the neighborhood that you live in. The reason why God planted you there is so that everyone in that neighborhood would be saved. Lead someone to Christ. Well, brother, how did you get all of that out of that story? 
I'm glad you asked. Because Jesus saw him. And I want to I want to implore you this morning to identify your Lord. The Bible tells us here that Zacchaeus um, was rich. It reminds us that Jesus, that um, Zacchaeus, as Jesus was passing through Jericho, that behold, there was a man by the name of Zacchaeus. He was a chief tax collector, and he was rich. Wait a minute. Chief tax collector and was rich. Mm -hmm. It was almost like um, um, Dr. Luke gave us his occupation and his capacity in the same sense. He's a tax collector and he's rich. How did he get rich by being a tax collector? Mm -hmm. It was almost like Luke was saying he's the head of the mob. He's a mob <laughs> boss. He's head of the mafia in this text. Because in that day and time, those who were tax collectors were schemers. They didn't only raise money for Rome, but they also raised a little something, something. Is that a right thing? Your poor bit. So they, they raised a little something, something extra for themselves. They were harsh. They were mean. Um, they were belligerent in terms of getting what they wanted. And here was Zacchaeus, who was rich and a tax collector. Verse 3 reminds us that he sought to see who Jesus was. But because of the crowd, and he was short of stature, he had to run ahead. He had to climb a sycamore tree. Mm -hmm. Brothers and sisters, the text reminds us in verse 5, and when Jesus came to that place, he looked up. This word here in Greek is where we get our English word binoculars from. He focused in on him. He looked up. He saw him. He identified his Lord. He saw him. And brothers and sisters, when he saw Zacchaeus, when he honed in on Zacchaeus, he knew that he had to visit with Zacchaeus on that day. I want to ask, who's climbing the tree to see you? Who's trying to a, a tree in order to hear the gospel around you? He said, brother, they don't climb trees like that in Winsboro. <laughs> I beg you different. There are always people who are trying to move closer so they can hear. There are people who are trying to be in your presence so they can just get a whiff of it. Because they know something is different about you. Mm -hmm. who, who's, who's going out of their way to make sure they're with you so they can hear the gospel? Who's climbing their sycamore tree like Zacchaeus? Because it was odd for Zacchaeus being rich and a tax collector to climb a tree. Rich folks in those days didn't run, they didn't skip, they didn't enjoy comedy, and they did not climb trees. But here we have Zacchaeus climbing a tree, doing something out of the ordinary so that he could see Jesus. When you find those in your community, that are doing something out of the ordinary. When you find those who are showing interest, when you find those who are facing a crisis, when you find those who want to talk about Jesus, when you find those who are the most hurt, when you find those who are angry at this time, when you find those who are asking spiritual questions, maybe they're asking spiritual questions because they're climbing the tree in order that they might see Jesus. And I want to know, how many people are around Winsboro first to the climbing trees that are right outside of our doors, that are living in our neighborhoods, that work with us, that are in community with us? They're climbing trees in order that they might see Jesus. And you know what you need to do? You need to identify that one. You need to focus in on that one. You got you to ask your question. What are they really looking for? And when you start asking that question, God simply reveals it to you. Which leads me to my next point. Not only did Jesus see him, but Jesus sought him. Mm -hmm. It's one thing to see someone, but it's another thing to move to the second base to go out of your way in order to meet with them. Jesus invested time in his walk. And that's what I'm asking you to do today is invest time in your one. Bible tells us in verses 6 through 8 here that Jesus, when he saw him, he told Zacchaeus in verse 5, as we close that verse, he says, Zacchaeus, make haste and come down, for I must stay at your house. So he made haste. That's what Zacchaeus did. Came down, 
and receive him joy. But when they saw it, this is the part of scripture you never want to go over. But when they saw it, they all complained, saying, He has gone to be a guest with the man who is a son. Um, brothers and sisters, did you catch it? Jesus saw him. Then Jesus went out of his way to, to, to be with him. To, to, he sought him. He wanted to invest in his one. He wanted to spend time with them, with, with Zacchaeus. He wanted to engage in his interests. He wanted to know Zacchaeus deeply. One commentator said it this way, how did he even know who Zacchaeus was? Like everybody else, he's hated. His name is on everybody's um, hit list. Everybody knew who Zacchaeus was. Mm. And it's possible I say we need to do it as well. He's already heard his name. He intense, he intentionally and actively sought Zacchaeus. Watch this. He says in verse 5, Zacchaeus, come down because I must go to your house. Mm -hmm. You know what? The problem I see in a lot of our Baptist churches, and I'm Baptist so I can say this, mm -hmm. is that when we say this, we want people to come to our house. But Jesus said to Zacchaeus, I must go to your house. Before you get them to come to the church house, you got to be willing to meet them on their terms. Right. You got to be able to meet them at their house. You got to say, you know what, where can I meet with this person that they feel the most comfortable in order to share their story? And Jesus was intentional about that. And he says, Zacchaeus, I must go to your house. I got to ask the gospel engagement question real quick. When is the last time you've gone to someone's house to share the gospel? When is the last time you've gone to someone's house to share the presence and power of our Lord? Well, Jesus says, Zacchaeus, I want to go to your house. And Zacchaeus makes haste. Y'all see it in verse 6? He makes haste. He's coming down. He's excited. He, he feels the urgency of the moment. And he's excited about having the Savior. But it never seeks to amaze me. Anytime gospel engagement is going on, someone has to complain. Can you hear the guys in the background saying that? Uh, he has gone to be a guest with a man who is his son. You know, I, I had the privilege of going to Israel um, a couple of years ago. My family and I spent three weeks there with one of our beloved props, Dr. Brian Byer. While we were in Israel, we learned a lot about the culture, about the geography. Uh, we learned a lot about the attitudes, the way people live, the way people would have lived in that day and time. One thing I've noticed about living in Israel is that they, didn't, they never learned the theology of whispering. Y'all can catch that halfway home. Huh? They, they never learned the theology of whispering. In other words, when they say stuff, they say it really, 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 really loudly. Mm -hmm. And um, matter of fact, we were in the square one day right outside the, the, the wall. And they got into a little dispute. Instead of whispering, it was the loudest commotion you ever want to see. It was louder than an NBA game and a football game put together, mm -hmm. even if it's the Super Bowl. I mean, they were just loud. We thought we had to duck half for our lives. After they got through arguing, they put their arms around one another and said, let's go get something to eat. They're just loud <laughs> in Israel. So I can imagine, as they said in verse 7, that he's gone to the house of a sinner. They didn't say it quiet. They said it loudly. He's going to be with a sinner. He's going to be with a sinner. And they probably followed up with sinner, sinner, sinner. He's going to be with a sinner. He's going to be with somebody they hate. He's going to be with somebody they don't trust. That they don't like. I'm going to ask a very inappropriate question at Winsbelt first. Can you fix it when I leave? <laughs> Have you ever disliked someone so you wanted Jesus to dislike them too? And for the folks who were complaining in this text, 
they didn't like this son. So they thought Jesus shouldn't like this son either. They weren't going to his house, so they felt like Jesus shouldn't go to his house either. And you know what? I love it. Even in the midst of their complaints, Jesus still went. Amen. And I don't know what was said in the house, but when Zacchaeus emerged from the house, here's what he said. He said, look, Lord, I give half of my goods to the poor. And if I've taken any, anything from anyone by false accusation, I restore fourfold. Wait a minute, wait a minute. Zacchaeus, how much you gonna give? I'm gonna give half. Then from the people I've cheated, I'm gonna give it back fourfold. This is the beauty of the gospel. Because some people talk about being transformed, but transformation is always followed by your behavior. And by action. He says, I'm going to give away half of what I have. And I'm going to restore it to that one. Fourfold. Can you, can you see Zacchaeus? Can you see Zacchaeus in your community? Maybe for someone here, it's a family member. So Maybe someone here, it's an enemy. Somebody that you never want to talk to. And uh, you, you've been enjoying and, and, and basking in the fight that one day this person is going to hell and God is saying, no, why don't you go talk to them so that heaven can be your home. Why don't you change the trajectory of their lives by sharing about the Lord Jesus Christ? Who's your one? And of course, for this group, their one wasn't Zacchaeus, but I'm glad the one was the Savior. The Savior chose his one, and it was like this. You know, not only did Jesus see him and saw him, but Jesus also saved him. That's right. Anybody glad about being saved this morning? Amen. 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 I'm glad about being saved today. I told y'all earlier, I'm from Dillon, South Carolina. I'm getting close to 50 now. I can look back in the rearview mirror and see so many of my classmates that didn't make it out. That died, that died from drug overdoses and alcoholism. Life fell apart in shambles. And I'm so thankful that the Lord saved me. I mean, He saved me. He washed me in His blood. When the choir was singing about the blood of the Lamb, uh, amen, I get it. On the hill, far away, looking over the cross. Because Jesus saved me. I know I'm in the wrong church to say this. Hallelujah. Jesus saved me. Amen. 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 Jesus saved me, y'all. And it doesn't mean I'm perfect, but he saved me. Amen. Invite the one, your one, not to trust in you, but to trust in the Savior. And here's what it says in the scripture. And Jesus said to him, today salvation has come to this house because he also is a son. Hey, wait, 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 wait. Pastor, I, I don't know about you, but Jesus is just messing up now. Uh -oh. We just complained in verse 7 that he's hanging out with sinners. Now he put this sinner, you're not with me, Pastor Craig. Pastor Craig. <laughs> he put this sinner in the family. Oh, that's right. It's almost like he invited this sinner to the family reunion. <laughs> That's what he did. Because now he's saying he is also a son of, hey, he ain't, he ain't no kid to me. <laughs> I don't know why he's calling him a son of Abraham. Because now he's trusted Christ as Savior. Now he's my brother. Now he's part of the blood washed family of the Savior. He is the son of Abraham. And can you imagine how these people who are standing around complaining, shouting, set up, all of a sudden hearing that this guy is part of the family and they have the same father? Praise God. They almost want to see him like a stepchild. Y'all ain't with me on that one. He is the son of. Abraham. Every time I read this, I chuckle. 
because of what's supposed to be there. But thank God the Savior invited him there. Mm -hmm. Thank God that he was the Savior's one. Can I ask you a question again? Will you invite your one to trust in Christ as Lord and Savior? Somebody said, um, um, how do you know when a person is ready to trust Christ? How do you know when it's time to share the gospel? You know, you know how you know when they're ready? I know when they're ready when Christ is at work in their hearts. And I know when they're ready when God is doing something in my heart that prompts me to say, share this story one more time. And you know what? Sometimes I share the story and the person I share the story with says, I'm not ready yet. I say, that's fine. But you know what I do? I write their name and number down and I call them up next month, and I share the story again. They said they're not ready that month, I call them back the next month, and I call them back the next month, and I call them back the next month. You know why? Because something is going to happen in their life that makes them ready. And when they're ready, I'm there for the plug. I'm ready to share this story and see their lives transform and see the good news of the gospel. There's a friend of mine I've been sharing the gospel with 13 years. And every time I tell, talk to him, he tells me he's not ready. The other, the other month, I got discouraged. I said, I'm tired of talking to him. And he must have sensed it. He said, but you know, he told me before I hung up the phone. He said, call me back next month. Because next month I could. I said, Lord, thank you for the hope. Mm -hmm. Brothers and sisters, who are you inviting to trust Christ? Who are you inviting to be a part of this family? So we can tell this community he's a son of Abraham now. Mm -hmm. He's trusted in Christ now. You know, I had a gal get saved in my church um, several years ago. Matter of fact, it was about three years ago. She'd have been incarcerated for a long time. And when she got to church, and I shared with her, she came to church. Her warden is also a member of my church Ooh. and that she had been in prison with. And she got to church. And um, she asked the warden, could she sit where she was sitting at? And the warden told her she didn't have to sit out. You're not in prison anymore. You're good now. And, um, and a week after she came, she was just with me. And um, after a while, she got saved. When the next lady came in that had been in jail with her, she said, if the Lord can save her, I know that the Lord can save her. Amen. Hallelujah. Yes. Amen. Amen. <laughs> The problem with some of our churches is that everybody in there was born on the pew. Mm -hmm. They've been in the Great church problem. so long until they don't know any sinners. Uh -huh. And if they know some sinners, they try to avoid them. Mm -hmm. They try to make sure they don't go to lunch with them. If they chew, smoke, or drink, we try to stay away from them. Mm -hmm. I try to make every sinner my friend. I've had some people around my table before, and they cuss and drink and smoke. They didn't drink in my house, but they, they still cussed, and it was all right. And they said, Reverend, I'm trying. I said, you know what? You just talk in the language that you talk in, and I'm going to talk in the language that I talk in. And all right, we're going to meet in the middle of one day. And I've seen so many lives change around my kitchen table. I've seen lives change around their kitchen table and in the place that they're in. Why? Because I want them to know Jesus, not just for no me. Here's my burden for this church this morning. And if I'm raising my voice too loud, sound man just turn me off. You know, <laughs> they didn't know it, but I'm African American and I get loud every day. <laughs> you get brothers. You got it. Brothers and sisters, I need you to share the love of Jesus in this community. I don't want you to have a good night's rest until you start sharing the love of Jesus. I want you to get a hit list together. You uh -huh. said a hit list. That right. sounds like mafia language. That's what Zacchaeus told me to tell you. Get to the hit list together. Write 10 or 15 names down. And say, I'm going to pray for this list until this list comes to know Jesus as Lord and Savior of Lord, their lives. Glory, hallelujah. Because that's your one. That's your one that God wants to use you. Wait a minute. I just heard one of you all complain. So can I bring up this complaint that you all just share, share with me? They said, preacher, that's your job. That's what we hired you for. The preacher can't do it all by himself. He can't win the whole community by himself. He's here to equip you. He's here to equip me. The sun is out into the community and watch a bad community. Come to know Jesus Christ. As Lord and Savior. Is that you today? 
When's the last time you shared about Jesus? Because the closer you get to Jesus, the more you want to talk about him. You know, I love my kids. You, you want to know how I love my kids? If you ever look on my Facebook page, you're going to see something about my kids. I post, I post pictures about my kids. I love, if you don't like me talking about my kids, don't look at my Facebook page. <laughs> but I, 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 I love my kids, so therefore I brag on my kids, I talk about my kids. They my kids. Y'all follow what I'm saying? Right. When you love something, you have to talk about it. Right. You love Jesus, why don't you talk about it? Why don't you share him with the lost and die in community? So Jesus saw our kids. Identify your one. I challenge you to get that list out today and start making a list. I shouldn't have called it a hit list, but Pastor Bailey will fix that when he gets up. <laughs> Jesus sought him. He invested in that one. He said, so Zacchaeus, I want to go to your house. And Jesus saved him. He invited that one, Zacchaeus, to trust. You invite your one to trust Christ. You know, if you send out a text this week or you call 10 or 15 people up that don't know Jesus and you just tell them that you're praying for them, I doubt they'll tell you, stop praying for me. Don't ever pray for me. It'll be, become more intrigued because somebody cares that somebody's praying. Would I be you today? I don't know what time I should be finished, but y'all look hungry now, so I go to my seat. <laughs> Who's your one? Amen.